hi, um, I'm Suzanne Hurton Roberts. I'm current president of WAPA. And uh, I want to welcome everybody here. Um, we have a wonderful um, session tonight. And Adam Dunson's going to speak to us about his work. Uh, Martha will introduce and Martha Hare, who's our program chair. Um, I did want to mention that um, coming up in January, we're going to have uh, a session. Our, our next session in January is going to focus on the concept, focus on the concept and preparation for uh, becoming a practitioner or applied anthropologist, professional anthropologist, whatever you want to call it. Um, we're going to have Kathleen Crane, who's president of NAPA. She's going to speak about NAPA, what's going on, um, and what NAPA, uh, how NAPA can relate to the people who are part of this organization, who are mostly professional practicing anthropologists. And then we're going to have um, Elizabeth Bridey, who spoke to us, I think, was it the last, our last session? Spoke to us briefly. We're going to have Elizabeth and Ryle Nolan, and they're going to be talking about the commission, and they're going to actually be um, conducting a free listing exercise with everyone. I'll send out an email to everybody um, so you know what's going on. Um, you can participate in the free listing or not, but you can still come and listen. You don't have to, to be part of that if you choose not to. Uh, so anyway, January should be very interesting and um, relevant for all of us. So I'm going to turn it over now to Martha, and Martha can introduce Adam. And I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, who is actually the host for tonight's program. All right. Okay. So uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Stouffer. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Adam Dunstan, who joins us from uh, Alaska this evening. Uh, Adam Dunstan is a three-field anthropologist uh, combining cultural, linguistic, and archaeology, in that order, uh, who does both academic and applied work at the nexus of environment, religion, and policy. He's done field work with struggles to protect indigenous sacred sites in the, the American Southwest, focusing on what this can teach us about environmental organizing, uh, blind spots of environmental and religious freedom policy, and the unexpected victims of climate change policy. <clears throat> More recently, he's involved in two projects. One investigates the experiences and perceptions of tourists at Latter-day Saint historic sites in New York. The other involves indigenous knowledge about salmon sustainability in South Central Alaska. Many of his projects have applied or engaged dimensions, and he's consulted with a number of tribal, governmental, and religious organizations. Adam is currently an assistant professor of anthropology at Kenai Peninsula College, where he teaches courses in a variety of topics, such as culture and ecology, and Alaska Native cultures. He earned his PhD in 2016 from the University of Buffalo. Uh, prior to his current position, he taught at the University of North Texas, where he mentored master's students in an applied anthropology program, who've gone on to governmental and other environmental anthropology work. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Adam and... Uh, Again, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Matt. And thank you for that introduction. Um, if I can briefly embarrass Matt for a moment. Um, Matt and I went to graduate school together and he was always one of my favorite people uh, in the program because he just had such creative ways of thinking about anthropology and we've been able to keep up the relationship uh, through the years over Facebook and he's just always a delight to talk to. He always gives me something interesting to think about and a different perspective than I had thought of. So uh, thanks for inviting me to this, Matt. I feel really honored uh, to get to be here. Um, honestly, this is probably the most nervous I've been for a public speaking thing in a long time. Uh, like most uh, professor types, I like to hear myself talk, but this is one uh, speech that I've been a little nervous for as I've been preparing for it, uh, partly because um, I respect and admire the work that practitioners do, and I consider myself um, sort of to have one foot in the world of anthropological practice, but definitely not full time. I've spent my career in academia. Uh, so you all are sort of the experts and especially on the topic that I'm going to be talking about today, sacred and historic sites. Um, I suspect that there's at least a couple of people here uh, that worked for, for the land agencies. Um, and so if that's the case, some of you may know this topic actually a bit deeper than I do, but I hope to share some thoughts that'll be uh, useful and interesting uh, from research that I've done 
uh, over my career with, as I said before, kind of a foot in the applied world uh, that's involved working, for example, for Diné Policy Institute, which is a policy think tank down on the Navajo Nation, um, consulting, as Matt was saying, uh, with a number of different organizations, with tourism boards, things like that about increasing tourism. Uh, so I've had, had some applied projects and things, and I hope today I can share some interesting thoughts. Uh, the title for my presentation is Politics Sits in Places, What Sacred Historic Sites Can Teach Us About Policy and Practice, Maybe. Uh, and this is my title, and this is where I'm from, Kenai Peninsula College up in Alaska. Um, and that is my email address if folks would like to keep in touch. So uh, quick question, can folks see this like line of images of people? Okay, so I'll minimize that so that that's not becoming a distraction. Okay, so um, sacred sites as a topic, I wanna talk about that for a minute. Uh, I've really spent my career uh, studying sacred sites, um, which actually goes back to 2009. So I started research um, while I was still an undergraduate, and it's all been sacred site related. And when you say that it's sacred site related, I sometimes find that I have to sort of justify that to other academic anthropologists, um, because it's not always, I guess sacred sites is one of those interesting topics that it's sort of always been around, right, all the way back to Durkheim, uh, talking about that in his elementary forms of religious life. Yet at the same time, it's often been Sometimes it's gotten a lot of attention in academic anthropology, but more often it's sort of been a secondary topic to get to other kinds of topics, right? There's been interesting work, especially folks like Vic Turner, for example, uh, and more recently, um, Eden Salinau's work. But generally speaking, it's, it's not sort of the central topic that some other kinds of things are. At the same time, it's interesting because even though it's not always a huge topic um, for academic anthropologists, um, it is... I would argue a pretty significant topic in the applied and practice realm, uh, partly because of laws like the National Historic Preservation Act, um, RIFRA, um, EO 13007, right? These kinds of things actually come up quite a lot, especially if you work for organizations like Park Service or Forest Service. Um, so I hope then that sacred sites is an interesting topic. For some of you, it may directly apply to your work, and hopefully I'll have a few dimensions to share that you haven't thought of before, or maybe at least think of them in a new light. Um, I also think, you know, sacred space is an interesting topic to talk about today, uh, given our time and place, right? The time of the year is a time for, um, for the indigenous traditions that I've worked with when it's a holy time of year to do oral storytelling about um, creation stories, especially that may not be appropriate to tell in the summer. It's also, of course, um, a time of holy festivals for many of the world religions. So it's kind of seems like an appropriate time to talk about sacred space, an appropriate time of the year. Um, also, maybe an appropriate in the sense that many of you I know are located in DC, um, and DC is kind of a site of sacred spaces, whether we want it to be or not, um, for the civil religion of the United States, if we want to go back to Edward Vela's old idea. So um, hopefully it's kind of an appropriate topic then for our time and space. Today, though, I want to kind of make four points. Um, I want to argue that sacred places can be a very useful lens to think about four issues um, that I think matter in policy and matter in practice. The first one is the ambiguities and hierarchies that often exist unseen in policy language. Uh, the second of them is the connection of culture and vulnerability to pollution. The third of which is how sense of place shapes how we perceive pollution. And then number four, what people actually go to historic sites looking for. Uh, so I'm going to, time permitting, talk about each of these four points and do so with a different research project that I was involved in, um, or a different applied project in some cases. I should mention, by the way, um, if folks have questions, there will be Q&A at the end, but if folks have questions and want to put them in the chat, I'm very happy to answer them as I'm going along as well. Um, so first, I want to talk a little bit about that first point I was saying, that sacred places can act as a very powerful lens to think about the ambiguities and the hierarchies that are sometimes not seen, but there in policy language. So I want to talk about that um, through the San Francisco peaks. And so I want to ask, and here I actually will look at the gallery of photos again, if folks can give me like a thumbs up or a party emoji or whatever you know how to do on Zoom, if you have heard before of this specific case study, because it's a pretty well-known one, not as well-known as like Keystone, but some folks do know about it, especially if they have government work. So folks know about the San Francisco peaks case? Okay, I'm not seeing a lot of hands. So in that case, then uh, I will give a little bit of background just to make sure it makes sense. 
Uh, so the San Francisco peaks, despite the name, are not located in California. It's a, a cluster of ma mountain spires located just outside of Flagstaff, Arizona, in northern Arizona. Um, it's a real obvious mountain. It just pops right out of the landscape, and it's just visible for miles and miles and miles. It's located really close to the Grand Canyon, to give you some spatial reference. The mountain, uh, why it's called San Francisco Peaks, is it's named after St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, but the mountain has other names as well. It has 13 other indigenous names because it's actually a holy site to 13 different indigenous nations in the area, uh, such as Zuni, Hopi, um, White Mountain Apache, and the group that I specifically worked with, uh, the Diné or Navajo Nation. And so that mountain is a very holy space to many of the indigenous nations in the area. However, uh, with the influx of settler and resource colonialism, uh, and the way that the reservation boundaries were eventually drawn. It is visible from several reservations, but it is not a part of any of them. It is off reservation, um, and instead it's part of a national forest. The national forest, in turn, allows a small portion, or not so small, depending who you ask, of that mountain to be used for a private ski resort called Arizona Snowball. Uh, so it's important to kind of understand that right at the outset, that this is a uh, significant cultural place to many of the local tribes, but it is not owned by any of them, and that it's owned, quote unquote, uh, by the federal government, but that a private ski resort operates on the space. So it's complex to say the least. Now in around uh, 2004, there's actually rumblings before this, but in around 2004, uh, that ski resort had been experiencing uh, really, really short ski seasons sometimes because Arizona, <laughs> but also because of climate change and drought, a multi-decade drought. Uh, and so as a result, they were having very low snowfall. They proposed an expansion of the resort, and that expansion would include new runs and ski lifts, but also using artificial snow making with reclaimed wastewater. Um, for folks that aren't skiers or snowboarders, snow making in this context is a process by which water is pumped from another source um, frozen to a very cold temperature and then sprayed out with what's called colloquially a snowmaking gun. It's uh, sprayed out over a ski slope and it's a way of making snow when nature isn't providing it the way you want it to. Uh, but again, drought conditions. And so rather than use a freshwater, so well, I shouldn't say freshwater, instead of using an unused water source, uh, instead the idea was that the which did eventually get approval after a very long legal fight, the idea was that they would use reclaimed wastewater, water that had been used municipally, um, gone into river system, gone through a sewage treatment plant, been treated in a number of different ways to remove contaminants, and then sprayed out over the mountain. Um, and this was approved by the Forest Service and approved by the city, which sold them the water. Um, and one of the arguments for it being approved was that the water was quite safe, that it was A plus quality level reclaimed wastewater, which is an actual legal category for the ADEQ, the local environmental commission for state of Arizona. Despite these assurances, um, there has been opposition for the past over 15 years now from a variety of different groups, uh, including national and international activists and environmental groups such as Sierra Club, um, local activist groups, um, who I'm not going to name specifically for confidentiality reasons, they're small enough groups that identifying the group would identify the people potentially uh, that I worked with, but a variety of local activist groups um, opposed the snowmaking, and then also a lot of different um, tribes, some of whom actually took the Forest Service to court over this, uh, including most prominently the Navajo Nation, uh, who alleged that this was a violation of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and a violation of U.S. policy about religious freedom in sacred sites uh, because it violated their ability to use that site. That went back and forth with varying decisions at different levels of the court, but was eventually decided against the Navajo Nation. That will be important in a little bit. Uh, but I've done research on this specific topic since 2009 until 2016. So I did research. I started out as an intern with Diné Policy Institute, which is affiliated with Diné College and is a um, think tank which seeks to integrate, as they see it, traditional Navajo thinking with um, government recommendations and social science research to make recommendations to the Navajo Nation government on a variety of different issues. So while I was interning with Diné Policy Institute or DPI, I started to do research on this topic. I did interviews in a town called Loop, um, which is a small town just on this side of 
the Navajo Nation border. So right before you get into non-reservation areas. Um, so it's close enough that it can see the mountain, but it's not next door to the mountain. And so I did interviews with folks there about sort of the opposition to snowmaking and what were some of the main reasons that people were opposing it and also to get a sense of how widespread the opposition was because we knew that um, politicians were certainly concerned about it. Navajo Nation politicians had taken it to court, uh, but there was less of a clear sense of where the public sentiment was in some of these communities. So that's kind of where the project started, kind of a social impact assessment, if you want to think of it that way. And then over time, it sort of morphed and evolved for a variety of reasons. Eventually, I was no longer working for DPI, but I was a graduate student at University of Buffalo, um, and I was working under folks like Dennis Tedlock and so and Don Pollock. Um, and so a lot of my works kind of started going in a linguistic direction. Um, and as a result, I got really interested in how um, activists, for lack of a better word, I don't always love that term, but how activists were framing the issue of snowmaking. And especially when you had groups that had roughly equal numbers of um, indigenous participants who were both folks from Flagstaff, but then also folks from the reservation. But then you also had a large number of um, settler activists from a variety of backgrounds, um, some of which were very decidedly atheist. And I was kind of interested in, well, this very like religiously charged sacred site topic, how does it get sort of framed when you have folks from all these different cultural backgrounds um, speaking about it and presenting a united front when they do things like throw a protest or do a march. Um, so that was sort of my project. And I found some interesting things. Um, and one of the things that I found, um, and I've written a lot about this, so there's papers that if you wanna go read, you're welcome to, uh, or my boring dissertation, you can read that as well. But one of the things that I thought was interesting is that at protests, um, folks would often, would sometimes use the specific phrase, the specific chant, what part of sacred don't you understand? And in particular, activists were using that during the religious freedom lawsuits. They would be outside of the courtroom chanting, what part of sacred don't you understand? Um, and I thought that that was interesting. Interesting partly because it showed a frustration and kind of an idea of why do we have to have elderly medicine people in the courtroom trying to explain this to the court, why it's a religious freedom loss uh, infringement, when we already said that during the environmental impact statement process, when we already said that during NEPA, and also it's not complicated, right? It's a sacred site, it's being violated, it's a religious freedom issue. That was kind of the sentiment of some of the activist folks. Yet at the same time, although that's very true, I want to push back just slightly on it, to say that one of the challenges with sacred sites for folks that work in the policy realm and the practice practitioner realm, I think, and from what I've seen, and also um, for folks that are just doing research on sacred sites, period, is that they do vary so tremendously much, right? Um, the Vatican is not the San Francisco Peaks, and the San Francisco Peaks is not a household Hindu shrine, uh, and neither of these things um, are the Salt Lake LDS Temple, right? These aren't the same things, although they have similarities enough that we can put them together in a category called sacred site. And so we kind of have to understand each sacred site on its own terms. Um, so briefly for Navajo Nation, traditionally, the San Francisco peaks are uh, is the how it's called in Dene Bizad, the Navajo language, it translates roughly to always snowy on top. Uh, it's this yellow mountain here. So it's one of four sacred mountains within which it is taught Dene, is Dene Bikea, the land of the Navajo. And it's thought in traditional teachings that within these four mountains, people are protected. And in this, um, this is actually the flag of the Navajo Nation, and it has a rainbow here. And one of the teachings says that uh, it's like being protected by a rainbow when you're within the four mountains. Um, some folks will also say the mountains are like pillars which hold up the sky, kind of holding up the sky. Um, then, interestingly enough, other folks you interview will say that doesn't make any sense at all. So there's definitely diversity here and different people have been exposed to different teachings about the space and don't always agree with each other on these spacings. It's not um, as if there's like one central office that establishes orthodoxy for everybody. Um, nonetheless, there are some common teachings and concepts. These mountains are thought to be very sacred to have been established at the um, origin of Navajo people merging into the present day world, uh, thought to be a protection, thought to be like a mother. Um, and it's also a place where people go to conduct prayers, uh, where people go on journeys of fasting. Uh, traditionally, it was mainly medicine people, Hatali, who would go there. Um, people do offerings there, like corn pollen offerings um, and prayers, like I said, collection of 
certain medicinal plants, which can only be found there, uh, and just generally perceived as a sacred and holy site. And when I would talk to folks about the snowmaking and what was going on, um, overwhelmingly people opposed it, um, whether or not they were at all involved in activism, overwhelmingly the folks that I interviewed were opposed to it. And there's a lot of interesting things about that, including the fact that that even included a lot of folks who identified as Christian rather than traditionalist and would say that quite clearly, but still opposed um, the mountain, the snowmaking on the mountain. And folks would bring up a variety of different reasons, but the most common and the one that people usually always led with was it's one of the four sacred mountains. And as you would interview people more, people would bring up all sorts of different impacts from the snowmaking, some of which came through in the court case uh, and a lot of which didn't. Uh, so one thing was ceremonial impacts. So one person brought up the idea so um, that the soil would be contaminated from the snowmaking. So to clarify, there's soil from each of the mountains that's used in something called jish, which is like a, a sacred medicine bundle. Um, and that's a very sacred thing and I'm not gonna go super into that, but the, that's used, among other things, for blessing way ceremonies, which are a major branch of Diné ceremony. And so folks felt, uh, one person expressed the idea that the soil would be contaminated by the snowmaking, which would then make the jish, the soil bundle, uh, the medicine bundle, not work very effectively. So then people would turn away from the ceremonies. And as he put it, they would go to other sources for healing, such as self-destructive behaviors like substance abuse or self-harm. So he said in that way, it's actually cultural genocide for this to be happening. Um, another person remarked, she said that, you know, we have to do prayer somewhere where we can also do an offering on the mountain where we can put corn pollen or some other kind of offering that has to be done in an undisturbed location the problem with the snowmaking is that everything's going to be disturbed and therefore we can't do prayers and therefore the gods are going to leave is actually the way she put it everything's going to leave the animals the gods um that was an interesting quote in a lot of ways that's certainly not something i don't think that was universally held um and i certainly saw people continue to ceremonially interact with the mountain but it was an interesting point of view. Um, and it was interesting partly because for folks that are supportive of the ski resort, including of course the business owners, the argument is very often, this is a very small area of the mountain range. This is about 1% of it is what they will usually say. Um, but from her perspective, um, Rochelle, she was saying, you know, the entire thing is harmed. Um, and it became clear in interviews as I would talk to more people that part of what was going on there is yes, the idea that water obviously, like snow doesn't stay put, right? Water melts and it percolates into the groundwater, or it runs down the mountain, it doesn't stay put at the ski resort. But the other point that was being brought up is that people were comparing the mountain, not just to a place or a piece of land, but instead to a body that it was quote, like a holy being standing there. And so one person said, um, you know, they say 1%, but if you inject a drug into 1% of a person, it doesn't stay put, it goes throughout the whole body. Um, so the argument here was sort of that the entire sanctity of the entire mountain as an integrated entity would be harmed, um, and therefore there'd be no place to do prayer. Um, people also expressed that medical plants would be polluted, um, that there would be effects on animal health, that there would be effects on human health, and also that the mountain itself would be harmed. So people would say, I'm sorry, that's a typo. Uh, people would say that it, it was like carving into her side, like when they would put the pipeline in to pipe the water up from Flagstaff to the ski resort, or that it's like throwing a chemical mixture on somebody. Now, as I was, that was all really interesting and important findings. But one of the things I was interested in is why, though, is snowmaking so destructive, something that uh, in the eyes of those promoting it, in the eyes of some of the government policymakers, was uh, a fairly clean source of water, again, A plus quality, quote unquote. Um, and as I started talking to other anthropologists about that, I was interested in sometimes some of the sort of wrong assumptions they would make when I first started explaining it. Um, so for example, folks that had read Clyde Pluckhone's uh, classic fieldwork on the Navajo would be like, oh, well, it's because it's associated with poop, right? Wastewater. Uh, and therefore it's associated with witchcraft because of sort of the scatological notion of witchcraft that Cluckhone talks a lot about. Um, that was not the case, at least from what I saw, literally no single person brought that up. People would bring up the idea of snow being linked to defecation, but in a very different way. Um, they would talk about it as, quote, this is like, shitting on our religious freedoms, 
or this is like pissing on a crucifix. Um, so in that regard, people weren't relating it to witchcraft at all. Um, people were thinking of it as a breach of relationality, that it was a fundamental show of disrespect. And here I'm using the phrase politics sits in places, kind of reappropriating uh, Keith Basso's wisdom sits in places. Um, politics sits in places, right? People were seeing this through a political relationship lens and also through a lens of a of sort of Navajo relationality, which is always to be thought of in reciprocal terms traditionally. And so people would say, you know, we don't do this to your church. Why are you doing this to ours? Um, and in that regard, you have to think of it in that context and also in the context of centuries of colonialism. People would say, you know, this is not the only sacred place this has happened to. It's also happened to other places like Mount Taylor where there's uranium mining. And people would also say, you know, this fight has been going on for 400 years since settlers first got here. Um, so it's not just this new, right, battle, but it's also this new battle contextualized in centuries of history. Um, and in that regard, I think, a lot of folks were bringing up the importance of thinking about impact, environmental impact in broader terms than we sometimes do. I think there's been really positive moves in the last couple of decades for folks that are involved in NEPA work to think about impact as not just singular impacts, but instead cumulative impacts of the entire project. Um, but folks here were even broadening that out further and saying, you have to think about it as far as the impacts that have already happened at this sacred site and this sacred site, right? All of those together affect our religious practices. So we have to think about impact in really broad terms, uh, which I thought was an interesting insight uh, for us as policy, for folks that might be involved in policy. And although we don't write the policy, I think it is at least something where as people are doing social impact assessment, it is something to keep in mind what people mean by impact and that they might have a much broader frame of reference for that uh, than sometimes the categories were given through policy. Um, another thing that became clearer in talking to people was that there were ceremonial contaminants that a lot of people weren't realizing. So most people, for example, that were writing news stories about it were emphasizing, oh, poop, snow, defecation, etc. Um, the yuck factor, as they would sometimes say. Um, but interviewing people would sometimes bring up things, uh, especially one person in particular brought up the fact that the water, um, having been through hospitals, has been in touch with the dead. And also the water has been in touch um, with menstrual fluids having gone down toilets. And that these two things um, don't profane the sacred material of the mountain, but sort of render it in a different state. Uh, and therefore in a state that would normally require some kind of purification um, process, but which isn't being purified in this case in the ceremonial sense. And so therefore there were contaminants in the water, as one person said it, contaminants that they can't test for right? Not contaminants like E. coli or something. Um, I've got something in the chat. Thank you. I appreciate that, Andrea. Um, so the there were contaminants that don't show up on the list of pollutants that are tested for by um, Arizona Department of Environmental Quality to give the green light for a clean water permit. And so there was a fundamental disagreement about pollutants. But importantly, these weren't phrased as spiritual pollutants, quote unquote, these were physical pollutants in the eyes of the uh, folks, just ones that were not captured by the kinds of chemical testing that were being done. Um, another thing is that people saw this as fundamentally contrary to natural order. Um, the idea of Hojon, which is essentially impossible to translate into English, but among other things, the idea uh, within much of traditional Diné teachings of a way of living in which one is has harmonious relationships with and proper relationships with both one's human environment, but also the holy people, but also the land itself, um, sort of literally broken down. Sometimes it gets translated just as sort of beauty, or but it's a lot bigger of a concept than that. And so people express the idea, you know, I would sometimes ask, well, what if the snowmaking was done with fresh water? And people would say, no. <laughs> Most people would say, no, it would still be offensive. Um, not everybody would say that, but a lot of people would. And they would say, you know, with anything man-made, there's going to be danger. The artificial snow, the biggest problem is that it's artificial, that it's fundamentally going against the seasons, that you're not supposed to, as one person said, it get in front of the seasons. 
and therefore that trying to make snow happen when you wanted it to happen for a ski resort was violating natural order and anytime you did that it was going to take away from sort of the natural beauty and health that is natural order. So that's a lot deeper than just saying yuck factor of snow. So there's all these kind of layers of pollution that have to do with culture and have to do with history, um, a lot of which were sort of coming through in the courtroom and sort of not, and definitely not coming through in sort of the simplified news articles and things that people were reading at the time. Okay. Robert says, thanks for a very interesting question as you demonstrate straight controversies such as San Francisco Peak involve conflicting worldviews. Um, can you suggest any approaches through which the conflict can be mediated through converging cultural logics rather than simply as a battle of conflicting rights claims? Uh, that is an excellent question, Robert, and one that I have struggled and grappled with for as long as I've been working on this project. Um, EO Hardgraves, you know, he brings up the idea in one uh, article that sometimes in cases like this, they're kind uh, native plaintiffs are kind of at the mercy of whoever is the regional forester at the time, or the park superintendent, or whoever is locally in power. Um, and I bring that up. That sounds like a pessimistic point, but I actually think it's an optimistic point for the point that you're making um, and the question that you're asking. That I think, to the extent that we can properly kind of make these messages clear um, to people that do work in the land management realm and to the extent that that can work itself up to levels like regional forester, I think it's possible for NEPA processes uh, to be more expansive and more inclusive of different ideas of impact and different ideas of pollution. If there's somebody heading the process, looking over the process that has that kind of cultural knowledge. So that's kind of answer one to your question. Um, answer two to your question is irregardless of of the government. Oh, I just said irregardless. My English teacher spouse always tells me that's not a word. So sorry, regardless of um, what the government is doing, um, I think the activist group that I particularly worked with was a really fascinating example of melding different ways of speaking about the harms of snowmaking uh, so that it was kind of a convergence of cultural logics. So I'd point people to my um, dissertation if you're again willing to read something a little boring. Uh, Andrea says, I can speak to this about the differences between Utah and Arizona. Utah policymakers work with tribes to address policy changes, even in the very publicized fight around beers ears. Yeah, Arizona sailors do not have a track record of this. Um, the best examples I've experienced have been in Montana, New Mexico, Arizona is far behind Utah's learning. Yeah, so definitely, um, you're welcome, Robert. Definitely Bears Ears um, is a really good response of where there was definitely a different model of collaboration uh, than we've seen in Utah and other places. Um, and I think the point that you're making, Andrea, uh, really does show that it can really just depend on who's there locally. Um, one of the wonderful and terrible things of the NEPA process is that it can vary tremendously by who's doing the impact assessment and who's over it locally. Um, there was also national pressure here, which needs to be considered. Um, some of this was outside of the control of the Forest Service. Um, there was... Um, Senator McCain was pushing very heavily for this project, for example, and there was other people that were pushing very heavily for it at the national level. So, and the snowmaking industry. Yes, definitely. Uh, so thank you for all of these questions. They're wonderful. So my point here, you know, again, we don't write the policies. We can't make, wave a magic anthropological wand and make the policies something they're not. But I think there is a real possibility for those of us who do get involved in environmental impact assessment work to think of pollution in a lot more complex way and understand that the people we're speaking to might be thinking of it in a much more complex way than we sometimes give credence to. Um, and, you know, one of the points that I ask here is, does it matter if we decide mountains are not, are or are not living beings? Um, I'm going to skip that really. Uh, but one of the, I would say that, yes, it matters greatly that there are these conflicting ideas of the mountain, because that then shapes how policy is interpreted. So in a, one paper, I kind of did a deep dive into the Navajo Nation, the USFS case, which affects really sacred site laws across the country, not just this one. And the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals made a number of statements like, um, this is the subjective emotional experience of the plaintiffs, or um, they still have access to the site is something that's been said in court cases about this space, or no actual springs were polluted. Um, so you saw this in this court case and also one that was going on about the same mountain back in the 80s. And one of the points that I've tried to bring up is that a lot of the terms that we have in things like the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, but also things like the 
quote, Indian Sacred Sites Executive Order 13007 is that there are phrases like preserving access or preserving use of the site, um, which seem clear, but aren't actually clear when we consider the fact that there's a lot of ontological assumptions going into that. Um, one could argue, and it has been argued, that the site is still usable, right? There's no concrete wall around the site. There's not even a concrete wall around the ski resort. And for most of the year, one can easily go onto it and um, participate with the site there. However, if you're thinking of the mountain like a body, like a being, and the whole thing is contaminated, is it really still usable? Is it really still accessible? Uh, or to say that the pollution that's being talked about is subjective, well, if one assumes that things like um, death pollution is a spiritual reality and not a physical reality, then yes, one's arguing that it's subjective, but that also means that we're sort of importing certain sorts of assumptions. Um, so my point there is that when language is ambiguous in policy and in law, it then falls off into judges, and judges often fall back on their own sort of culturally informed understandings of what these terms mean, uh, which may be sharply different from Indigenous plaintiffs. So on the topic of sort of is there bet more we can do as far as informing people of different cultural ways of thinking? Uh, it's not just for policymakers, it's also in the judicial system. All right, now I wanna shift to, yeah, and that is definitely true as well. Uh, that's something I deal with a lot up here in Alaska. Um, our historic preservation laws up here are arguably stronger than the federal laws in some cases, but it also, there's just a lot of variability based on that. That's a great point. Um, I will now spend a little bit of time talking very briefly about, I'm trying to get done by um, what for me is 350 and for you all is 750. So forgive me if I start to talk a little fast, I'll try to still keep it at a reasonable pace that you can hear me. But I wanted to talk a little bit about another aspect that I think place teaches us a lot about, which is the connection of culture and vulnerability to pollution. This will be a lot more brief, um, partly because the project itself was brief. I worked for a very short time as a graduate student um, with some people over at T Tuscarora Nation, which is a reservation uh, very close to where I went to graduate school at University of Buffalo. It was really brief. I had a very tangential role. I don't wanna oversell what this was, um, however, we were dealing with a reservation space that for the hydroelectric dam that sits on Niagara Falls had previously been flooded and a third of the reservation land had been lost on what is already a very small reservation. And then on top of that, there is now a hazardous waste site next to the Tuscarora Nation. And back when I was at grad school um, in the mid 2010s, it was the hazardous waste site they were proposing expanding it. And so I was uh, part of a group of people that was looking at sort of how do we respond to this hazardous waste site project that we probably don't really think is a good idea. And we ended, I ended up suggesting that we could approach it as an environmental racism issue because New York state, unlike some states has an environmental racism statute to it. And we, but that argument's kind of an interesting one, right? Because there's, yes, um, Tuscarora people living right by the site, but there are also rural white communities living right by the site. So how do you argue that it's environmental racism? Uh, but the point that I, and we were trying to kind of bring up is that it also varies not just by location, but also by cultural practice. And this is not sort of brand new information for anybody. Certainly this has been brought up in a lot of other contexts, uh, but we brought up the idea that because people on the reservation were doing a lot more fishing and hunting uh, than neighbors in the white community, uh, this put them at a particular vulnerability to um, pollution that would seep into the waterway that was right by the hazardous waste site. So thinking of vulnerability as something that's connected to cultural practices and not just as simple as the way that we and myself as an environmental anthropologist sometimes explain vulnerability as a matter of mainly location, but also as a matter of cultural practices and how that connects one in more or less ways uh, to pollution. And that's something that I very much see up here in Alaska as we have really tough conversations as we see climate change going on all around us and the ways that it affects some citizens more than others based on how much we do fishing or hunting or the way that a rural Inuit community is affected a lot more because a road becoming degraded because of permafrost thaw is a much bigger deal if you're a rural remote community where the state doesn't like to invest money than if you're in Anchorage. Um, so that's just a kind of minor point, not even directly related to sacred lands, but related to place that I wanted to bring up. Okay, we have another comment. Okay. It was somebody politely telling me 
don't worry about rushing through your talk. We do have a little bit of time here. Um, the third one that I want to talk about is also not directly a sacred place, but I think an interesting case study that people on the line might find interesting. Um, this after graduate school, I ended up working at University of North Texas, which has just an awesome applied anthropology master's program. Uh, I would probably still be employed there today if not for the fact that I really felt the call to come up here to Alaska uh, and do the kind of work that was available here. But it's just a, a wonderful uh, program. So if you have you know people that want to do applied anthropology work, definitely send them UNT's way. Um, but at UNT, at University of North Texas, it's located in Denton, Texas, which is a town well, I shouldn't call it a town, it's a city of about 150 to 200,000 people. It's growing really fast, so it's hard to keep track of the population, but it's located about 45 minutes north of Dallas. And um, it has really bad ozone pollution, which a lot of people don't realize, um, surface level ozone pollution. So of course, as we know, ozone up in the sky, or sorry, up in the upper atmosphere, good, protects us from the sun, uh, ozone down on ground level, um, you get smog, but you also get really bad effects for people that have uh, respiratory conditions already. So I became really interested in this both because I was working there and because I have a wife who's asthmatic and because my son has a pretty serious heart condition or rather did before he had surgery. Uh, so because of that, I got really interested in this pollution and interested in the fact that nobody was really talking much about it. They were talking a lot about fracking, which was a huge issue. And in fact, there'd been a successful campaign to get a fracking ban in the city, which Texas later overturned, state of Texas intervened in overturned it. But for a while, we had a fracking ban. Uh, but people weren't talking at all very much about the fact that we had really, really high levels of ozone pollution. Um, like one time I, for interest's sake and to make a good comparison, I compared the numbers of ozone pollution from like Denton to Manhattan. And it was in sometimes worse <laughs> in Denton. So just very, very bad rates of air pollution, ozone pollution. Um, and so I was very interested why people weren't talking about this more. So I did a project where I collaborated with Doug Henry, which some of you may know, especially uh, because of his work with AAA um, committee, but he's a medical anthropologist and he and I were looking at how people spoke about this and the degree to which they did or didn't connect it to things like the fact that Denton has a really high rate of children with asthma. Um, and so one of the things that I found really interesting is that, can I move this at all? So you can see that better. Okay. Um, one of the things that was very interesting as we had students going and doing interviews and surveys in the community and as they were bringing back this information from their interview experiences and their survey experiences was that people's view of how clean the air was or how polluted the air was varied tremendously um, across the board from, you know, literally like one to nine out of a, on a one to 10 scale that we were asking them. And that it kind of averaged out to six, but it averaged out to six because there was a lot of people on both ends of that. And what was doubly interesting though, was how people came to that, the conclusion. People it had a lot to do with place of origin. People that were from rural farming communities near Denton or in Oklahoma saw it as a very polluted space. And they would tell stories of, oh, I go out running and the air feels heavy. People that were from Dallas, um, which is much larger, of course, than Denton, would share stories of how beautiful and clear the sky was there, even though Denton arguably has worse ozone pollution. Um, but of course, ozone, unless you have really, really bad ozone uh, conditions like certain parts of California, um, ozone typically isn't visible. So people couldn't see it, which brings up the second point. Uh, people relied heavily on their physical senses, but in strange ways. So for example, when we were doing surveys, people would smell the air um, and then rate the air on a quality of one to 10 of pollutedness. But of course, ozone's not something you can smell, um, again, unless it's in a really, really high concentration. And so that was interesting. But then the third thing, and probably the most interesting, is that people based it on their sense, quote unquote, their sense of place of Denton. They perceived the city as a very green or environmentally friendly city, partly because they've maintained a lot of their tree cover, despite big population boom, partly because of the fracking ban that happened, and partly because the university has a very strong environmental philosophy department, a philosophy department that has a lot of prominent environmental um, ethicists like Eugene Hargrove, um, and then also an environmental anthropology program that's pretty strong. And um, so they 
viewed the university as very environmental and they saw the tree cover so they just assumed that there wouldn't be much pollution here so in a space where pollution wasn't visible uh, they made assumptions based on sort of the kind of landscape identity they had for the space uh, to go back to greater and Garkovich's classic report on landscape right and that was true even when to some degree their lungs told a different story so I found that very interesting um, the final thing I want to talk about today about place is a project that I've been involved with for the past four years um, although it's still very much in early stages, it was very much interrupted by the pandemic. And this is what people go, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what sacred places can teach us about why people go to historic sites and sacred sites and what they're looking for. Um, so I've been involved over the past four years with research in Western New York, um, close to Rochester, really close to Rochester. There's a tiny little town, Palmyra, New York, and that town is the birthplace of the Latter-day Saint movement, which includes a variety of different denominations and groups um, that are pretty different from each other, but including uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is, of course, based out of Salt Lake City. And so at, in that town, um, there are several significant sites uh, for the Latter-day Saint movement. I was specifically looking at two of them. One is a small forest called the Sacred Grove. It is the place where Joseph Smith reported first seeing God and Jesus Christ in a vision. The, and it was very close to his house, so sort of the beginning of his career as a religious figure. The second site is a small little hill um, called the Hill Cumora. Um, they now do actually a play on the Hill Cumora, uh, a Book of Mormon based play, not the Book of Mormon musical, a different Book of Mormon based play. But anyways, um, the church now puts on a play there, but it was originally a site where um, Joseph Smith reported receiving the record that became the Book of Mormon. So these are two really important historic sites, and they attract thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of Latter-day Saint visitors every year, despite New York um, or at least upstate New York, not really having a very strong Latter-day Saint presence. They're there, but just not that many. But thousands come during the summer to visit these sites. Um, and so I consulted a little bit with a tourism office out there, the Wayne County Office of Tourism, so that they could better understand why people come out to the sites and what they're looking to experience, partly because there was concern because the church was actually canceling the big play. So, you know, are tourists still going to come out? Because for some people, that's hundreds of thousands of revenue in, you know, pizza or hotel hotel rooms or different things. Um, it's a big tourism draw. Um, and so there was... I was consulting a little bit with them. Uh, over time, I also came into touch with uh, people from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I eventually uh, received approval, which is something I should have done at the start, but I didn't realize it at the time, uh, but received approval through what's called the Correlation Research Division, uh, and now kind of have a working relationship there with where, as I come up with findings, uh, we're supposed, they allow me to do research on site, and in theory, I um, share findings back, especially to the degree that it might help in the managing of these sites so that the church can better understand um, why people are coming to the sites, what draws them to the sites, what they're experiencing, because it's not a sort of formal pilgrimage tradition. It, um, it's more of sort of an informal pilgrimage tradition that's grown up over the years. Um, so I did research at both of these sites, both of which are classified usually by the church as historic sites. And also, if you were to kind of pick up a tourism brochure in the area, they would label them both as historic sites, not necessarily as sacred sites. But the way people interacted with both sites was really, really different in a really interesting way. Again, these two sites both have huge significance to the sort of early church history. They're both right by each other. They're within about a 10 minute drive of each other. And they're both, if you're looking to kind of have an environmental beautiful experience they both have you know sort of that classic secondary or classic new york secondary forest that's you know a lot of people really enjoy walking around in but they were treated really really different um i did surveys with about 400 people online 400 latter-day saints and then i also did uh site visits over a couple of years and did informal interviews um with people and then also some formal interviews um with people as well. And one of the things that we found, or that I found, I should say, with the Hill Cumora is that people often spoken, spoke of it in very cognitive terms. They would say things like, it is a place to ponder our history. It's amazing to think about the Book of Mormon's origin here, there. Not as spiritual for me as the Sacred Grove, but still good to see the history. 
In other words, people used that historic site for what we often expect people to use historic sites for, which is they reflected on history. People would describe, oh, we went up there and, you know, um, the member of our family that knows the most about history, like did a little presentation or the missionaries talked about a pres about the history of the site or I thought about the history of the site. It was all these sort of cognitive terms about reflecting on history and people deliberately many, many times in both the interviews and in the survey said it was not as strong of a feeling as the sacred grove. By contrast, um, people talked about the sacred grove um, very much like a Latter-day Saint temple. They would say things, in fact, like when God doesn't have a temple on earth, he uses nature. The grove is like a temple for the world, which is a pretty provocative statement because it's rather unlike a temple in all sorts of ways, not just that it's not a building, but also in the sense that it's not used for religious ceremonies at all, um, whereas that is precisely what a temple is for. And it's also open in a way that temples typically aren't other than during um, open houses. And people would speak about that space in very emotional terms. And they would also talk about how they would use it for their own spiritual purposes, other than just sort of reinforcing church history. Because a lot of people that have written about this site kind of emphasize like, well, it's a site for people to, con for the church to kind of instill a sense of history on people, on tourists. But instead people would say things like, I go there and I feel like I can have a type of conversation with God that I might have in the temple, or it feels like a good way to explain what a temple is like, or I would do my personal scripture study there and pray there, not because we need to be in the sacred grove, but I felt close to uh, my heavenly father or God there. And so what was interesting to me about that is just two different historic sites, uh, one of which was again treated almost like a temple, one of which was treated almost more like a just kind of a classic place to learn history, almost more museum-like, um, and the differences there. And I think that's relevant. <laughs> You're saying, when is this going to get back around to practice? Uh, I think this is relevant for those of us who are involved in nonprofits, religious organizations, and governments that work with historic sites, and understanding that what a historic site means is not one thing. Sometimes it's treated like one thing, for example, in some of our policies about historic preservation, but it's really many different things. And the two things, even from the same religious tradition, two historic places can have really, really different valence because one is being used uh, for sort of these purposes of uh, these spiritual projects, whereas the other is being used more for sort of cognitive projects. So if you can separate the two in that way. And so that was sort of my last um, finding. This other one is is not terribly relevant. So um, history of the Cypress. So that's really what I wanted to share. Um, so in conclusion, you know, I think sacred places, although um, they haven't always gotten maybe the attention that I think they observe, and maybe I'm just doing what every ethnographer does and thinking that because I'm interested in a topic, it must be the most important topic in the world. But I really do think they have some interesting things to teach us, sacred places, and also just places more generally and how people perceive place. I think they have a lot of interesting insights to um, policy, especially environmental policy and cultural policy. And I also want to thank um, a variety of people, more numerous than I can really get into here, but that I wanted to list on this slide. So thank you so much. Also, if you'd like to keep in contact, uh, this is my email and that's my phone number, but um, I'm not in my lab all that often given what's going on right now. But so please email if you'd like to keep up the conversation though. And I'd like to now close the presentation part. And if it's okay with the organizers, open it up for any questions that remain. Well, Adam, thank you uh, for very, very interesting presentation. Um, so Adam, how are you extending this, this thread of inquiry into your new position in Alaska? Like, what are you doing? How are you taking this forward? That's a great question. Um, so I'm like looking on the Zoom participants to see if there's anybody from um, NSF since you're, some of you are DC based, I don't think so. So um, I just, cause this would be weird to talk about if there was anybody from NSF. We just applied for a big NSF grant uh, through the Arctic Social Science Program. Uh, and we specifically, it's a collaboration between myself, um, Kanaitsi Indian Tribe, which is a Denina group um, that's like 15 minutes from our college, their tribal headquarters. And then um, we're also collaborating with um, some people out of University of Illinois. And we're trying to kind of um, get, it will take some pretty significant funds, but we're trying to sort of do a place-based history of salmon in this area and how indigenous people have related to salmon in both subsistence ways and also sacred ways over the past 
2000 years really, and then parallel that with genetic research that the Illinois researchers are doing to try to show whether or not these practices have successfully maintained genetic diversity of the salmon population over time, and then how that's been changed with colonialism, which happened very fast in Alaska and very late in the process of colonialism. Um, and so it's still place-based research. It's less overtly about sacred places, but it's more now about sort of sacred relationship with fish and especially how that changes and looks different when suddenly um, a large number of people are working with commercial fishing rather than subsistence fishing. And when a large number of people have converted to Christianity and specifically Russian Orthodox rather than, um, so, and some of the traditional practices of become relatively muted. Uh, so that's where it's going now. And there's kind of a practical dimension to it. It's going to kind of, we're going to see where it unfolds, but we're hoping that it'll really help with the kind of work that Knightsy does. Um, I don't know how well people know Alaska state politics. I certainly didn't before I came here, uh, but there's often a lot of tensions um, with how salmon are managed, to say the least, um, and to what degree um, folks that are traditional indigenous users have a right to those resources and to manage those resources. So that's kind of where it's going in the future as far as my Alaska project. Thanks for that question, Andrea. I think that's really valuable. I'm, I'm seeing it in the mental health world um, where we're starting to use, like we're starting to see more use of non-pharmacological non approved substances. So, you know, um, substances like peyote or MDMA or others in mental health treatment for veterans with PTSD, for instance. But there's an article that just came out recently arguing indigenous tribes have used this for years and we're totally ignoring all of their knowledge and we're totally ignoring their use of this and how they use it to heal people. And um, I think as we move forward to integrate things like environmental concerns, health concerns and other things, the more, the more that we can use our tools as anthropologists to help integrate and help bridge the gaps between communities and policymakers is vital right now. It's, it's absolutely vital right now. So it's exciting to hear your work and exciting to hear how you're applying it to, to policy in um, Alaska. I do policy based, so. But. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. And if I can just piggyback on what you said just really briefly, there's so many things I want to respond to what you just said. But um, one of the things is, yeah, I mean, I talked a lot about place here, but I think there's the bigger question when we talk about sort of some of these different um, substances and plants. Um, there's this also this kind of conversation of um, plants as beings, right, versus plants as chemicals and the different sort of ontologies there. And that I think kind of raises some ethical concerns that have to be addressed, right? There may be significant potential, but there's also really significant concerns about sort of um, that I've heard from some indigenous groups about sort of how are we stripping these beings, right, out of their sort of relational context when we apply them in other places. So it's something to think about. Thank you so much for sharing that. Suzanne. Um, I'm not sure I'm getting this right. It sounded to me as though when you talked about the sacred, you were specifically talking about religion. But I would argue that things that are would be con considered secular can be very sacred truly sacred, not cognitive, not historical, but sacred for a people. My daughter's a preservationist um, in New Orleans in the French Quarter, and there are some sacred places there um, that if something were to happen to those places, there would be, I think people would consider it a, um, a wound to the collective spirit, to the collective body of the people of New Orleans. So I, I don't, I, maybe you'd want to speak a little more about what you're thinking about as sacred versus secular. And it seems that it blurs a lot. Or can yeah, I would. Yeah, I would. That's a great question. I would wholeheartedly agree that it blurs. And I think, 
part of what I think you're rightly picking up on, and I probably need to watch this for future times that I give presentations to anthropologists, is that um, last case study, I draw this really sharp contrast as sort of historic slash cognitive and sacred slash religious. Um, that's partly because some of the people I'm partnering with uh, are themselves part of that or religious sort of like researchers, right? right? And so it's a it's a vocabulary that makes sense to show them like, well, here's how folks are interpreting your two different sites, right? Um, but to your point, yes, blur very, very much. Um, there's this great paper back in the 90s that was written about the Pearl Harbor Memorial, right? And that's a really good example as well of a site that has very much sacred overtones in a almost entirely secular, non-religious context, right? And is managed mm -hmm. by the government. And we can definitely think of sites like that all across the country um, that play these prominent roles. Because sacred, I mean, right, literally sort of this like set apart, high valence space, uh, yeah, does not have to be overly religious. I think that's a very, very good point. So apologies if I drew the contrast a little too sharp between those two kinds of spaces, because I very much agree with you. Thanks. No, I just was... Not sure if I was mishearing you or. No, you're right. And it's it's something I've thought about more and more as time's gone on, as my research has started to kind of shift in forms and things. And it's going to be real relevant up here in Alaska, where, again, there's been a lot of religious change. And yet there are cultural sites that are still really, in a sense, a sacred site to the indigenous mm -hmm. group in question because of this central significance to history, regardless of any sort of spiritual entities. Right. And so I think right. that's a really good point. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Matt, please. So regarding the uh, the Sacred Mountain Project, <clears throat> once these mountains have, have you know basically been violated, how how do people think about going back from that? I mean, is there any sense of you know, how do you how do you how do you recover from that? I didn't ask that question as much as I should during research. I suspect like a lot of us after research, I kicked myself for some of the things that I didn't ask in some interviews where I would listen back over them and say, man, if I was back in the field or if I had the contact info for that person, I really wish I'd asked that. Um, and I think partly I didn't ask that because when I was doing the interviews um, was when it was still up, when it was still being fought. And then right towards the end of my research is when it got approved and went forward. Um, but people did occasionally allude to this when it would come up in conversation and people would talk about the idea of, well, there are ceremonial ways to cleanse land, right? Or they would say things like, well, the land can eventually purify itself. But this emphasis seemed to always be sort of on the eventually part of that equation, right? That this was going to be a process and that it was going to be a process of healing that was going to take a long time and have to involve the right people. And that that wasn't going to happen if we just kept doing it, right? Because it's an ongoing act of desecration. Um, I'll also point out too, Part of the thing I've struggled with a lot in presenting this research um, is that what people perceive as the impact on their ceremonial practices varies widely, right? So you have people who say, well, once the snowmaking happens, um, that will make it ceremonially unusable. But then I have also seen people, I also went on a, a hike with some people who did an offering even after the snowmaking had started, right? And so I think there's a degree to which sometimes people have to accommodate cultural practices in terrible situations, but that doesn't mean that their religious freedom hasn't been severely violated. So it's a kind of a complex thing. And I'm still kind of grappling with how to best explain this when I talk to people. So it doesn't seem like I'm minimizing what's happened or overselling it either, right? Because I think there's the temptation um, that we sometimes have seen in some sacred site cases for land managers to come up back with, well, you know, Indigenous people protested this other thing we did 30 years ago at this site that happened and people still do religious practices there. So therefore, as a way of sort of marginalizing native voices, right? So it's it's a complex thing, but I'm getting a little off track from your question. The point is to your question, I think most people agree that it's going to take a long time for it to heal and that that's not going to happen when that snowmaking is still happening. Thanks for that question, Matt. Thank you. I will say that um, as with any time we're dealing with the executive branch of the U.S. government, uh, this is one of those things that can change in the drop of a hat, right? Uh, this really is. And we've seen that a couple of times with the snowmaking thing. So as much as this seems as like kind of a moving, unstoppable train, uh, it's always kind of at the whim of the executive, right, who's over the Forest Service. So this definitely is something that could change and may change in the future. Um, it's not sort of a done battle. <laughs> 
Any other questions, comments, insults, objections? Okay, well, I want to thank you all sincerely for your time. Uh, you've all been an incredibly gracious audience. You've asked awesome questions. It's given me a lot to think about. Um, I do not mean this as a brown nosing comment, but as a very sincere comment, I always very much appreciate any time that I get to talk to actual practitioners in the field. Um, it always leaves me with lots and lots of things to think about. So thank you for your time and thank you for having me in this space. And I hope you all have a great evening. <laughs>